<laughs> Welcome to Biff's Mystery Theater. I have many tales to tell you. Ghost stories, murder stories, and tales that will make your bones chill. <laughs> Join me, won't you? Every Sunday night for theater of the mind, where you always have the best seat in the house. <laughs> Company presents Quiet Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please for today is called Northern Light. This is a story about the temporal displacement of mass. It is also a story about teleportation. Do you know what those terms mean? And I didn't think you did, but you stay right where you are, my charming friend, and you're quite likely to find out. You just stay right there and listen. I'll tell you everything you want to know. And maybe... Well, maybe a couple of things you're not terribly anxious to know. Ever see the Northern Lights? Aurora Borealis is their right name. You don't see them very often below the 50th parallel of latitude in this country, but up in northern Minnesota and Canada, upper New York, places like that... They're quite common of a winter night. If you've seen them, you know what they look like. If you haven't, there's no use by trying to describe them. Sometimes they fill a whole northern sky with waves of color, like a fire burning way beyond the horizon. Sometimes they're just long streamers of fire filling up the whole sky. And another time they look like gigantic, fringed curtains of pure light, swaying as if some cold cosmic breeze plucked at them way far off there to the north. And you can hear them, too, sometimes. Well, maybe not exactly hear them, but, but there's a sound, a humming, a, that crackling somewhere inside your head. And there are times when you'd swear it's a voice talking to you, talking in some kind of strange language you can almost understand, filling your whole being with a kind of desperate, inescapable terror. You know what I mean? At night, in the cold night, voices talking and saying things to you that you can almost understand, filling the night sky with signs and portents of, of inescapable terror. And nobody, nobody in the whole world knows what they are, nobody in this world at least, except me. And after I get done talking to you, you'll know too. And you won't be happy. Let me show you something now. This is from a recording I made on, uh, let's see, December 13th, 1948, a little more than a month and a half ago. I started the recorder while Norman and I were just about finished with our work that afternoon here in the laboratory. I just set the microphone on top of the file cabinet there and turned on the machine. Listen, I'm going to play it back for you. The quality isn't so very good, but you can recognize my voice and, and Norman's, I think. Here. Well, I got the call. We're gone now, I guess. Where did you test it? How can I test it when I say I just got to rewind? Well, hurry up. It's almost 6 o'clock. Yeah. Well, I'll be back in a minute. Well, I'll be back in a minute. 
Well, Dad, I didn't realize the time. Hurry up. I'm hurry. Um, be a display tonight, you suppose? How do I know? Been a display the last three nights. Well, that was a dinner last night, wasn't it? Yes, the machine wasn't ready. Hey, listen, now, do you think you can do better than I can? Ouch! What's the matter? Oh, I stuck my finger. Where'd you... Where'd you put the copper sulfate? Um, oh, up above the sink. Huh? Uh, I got it. What are you doing? Captain the coil. How's it? Oh, it looks okay. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, it's okay. I'll be right with you. Uh, hook it up. What are you going to send? You try my cigarette lighter. It won't work anyway. I'll, I won't miss it if we don't get it back. I don't know how the thing will work when the northern lights aren't shining. Well, maybe they are shining. Turn off the room lights. Let's see. All right. Pretty early, are you? Mm. What's the matter? Hey, look. Mmm. Hot early in there. Oh, boy, that's fine. The whole sky. Look, blue and yellow. Yeah, I, I never saw those long fringes before. They were the same. Oh, thank you. Turn on the recorder? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's turning over. Let's see. <clears throat> now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party. Yeah, leave it alone. Uh, you about ready now? Well, it's funny about the aurora. Northern lights? Listen to this part closely, friend. I don't know. Remember what I told you. You can almost hear the darn things. Uh, not hear them, I mean, but it's uh, it's kind of like somebody talking to you in a language you can you can almost understand. I don't know. I mean, do you ever notice it? Sure. High frequencies, I guess. Something. Awful lot we don't understand. Look, uh, you go over there at the recorder and talk into the mic. Talk what? Well, just describe what happens for the record. I know I'm not, sir. I know you're not, but... Just say what you see so we'll have an accurate record. Okay. Now? Go ahead. <clears throat> this is an experiment in the temporal displacement of a solid object. Uh, in other words, the first actual demonstration of a time machine. If it works. It'll work all right. Go on. Paul is now placing his old beat-up cigarette lighter on the stage of the hypercucambulator. And he is now setting the microchronometer to determine how far into the future he's going to send the lighter. Well, how far, Paul? Uh, ten seconds. Ten seconds. Now, at the end of that time, if our calculations are correct, and we hope they are, the cigarette lighter will reappear. In that period of time, it will have been into the future. Um, we could send it farther into the future if we wanted to, I guess, but... We'd just have to wait that much longer for time to catch up with it and make it reappear. But 10 seconds, well, I mean, uh, we can prove our point by sending it 10 seconds into the future just as well as 10 years ahead, and this way we don't have to wait so long. Hey, how am I doing, Paul? I go into your commercial. When Paul presses the little button, the cigarette lighter will turn to nothing. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not rocket. It'll be here, but it'll be ten now, seconds. Listen away. closely, please. Yeah. Well, now, What's uh, going to happen? Mr. Paul McGilligate, a famous mad scientist, is about to press the big old button and send his lighter into the future. You ready, Paul? Here we go. Stand by. My golly, it is gone. It just disappeared. Bang, like that. Hold your watch up close to the mic, Paul. So it'll record. Yeah. Um, the, 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 there isn't a sign of the lighter. Uh, the little stage on which Paul placed it is empty, and it should uh, appear again in, in just a second if it really did work. Three, two, one. It's back! It's back, Lord! It worked! We made it! Oh, man, let's, let's see if it's all right. Oh, Jesus! Oh, now what? Oh, the lighter. Oh, it's cold, Paul. Oh, here, here, here. Take it, take it, Paul. Take it. Oh, freezing cold. <laughs> what do you know? Look, the darn thing's like a piece of ice. Now, what are the dickens do you suppose it's been in that ten seconds? No, wait, friend. No, you're That's not the right. payoff yet. That's all only in the future. Listen. And time's caught up with it. It's, it's back, but... Hey, Paul, look. Where did that come from? What? There on the stage where the lighter was. Where'd that come from? In the middle of winter. What? What is it? It's a caterpillar, Paul. A brown and black caterpillar. 
Where do you suppose it came from? It wasn't there. Was I'll, I'll tell you where it came from, Paul. What? It came from the same place where the cigarette lighter went. What? What are you talking about? Well, feel it, Paul. Feel its fur. See? It's as cold as ice, too. A caterpillar. A little brown and black caterpillar, the kind they call woolly bears. You know, larva of the tiger moth, the I see Isabella. In the dead of winter and as cold as ice. Where did it come from? Huh? You want to know. Incidentally, you know, the old timers say that the woolly bear caterpillar is a weather prophet. If the brown bands on his fur are narrow, there's a severe winter ahead. If they're wide, it's going to be a mild winter. Yeah, maybe. This one, you could hardly see the brown bands. Tough weather ahead, that's what the old timers would say. But where'd she come from? She wasn't there when we put the cigarette lighter on the stage. When time caught up again, there she was. She? Sure, Isabella. I see her, Isabella. I uh, told you, remember? Well, she was wiggling happily when she arrived from somewhere in the future. But as she warmed up, she seemed to go into a trance, almost a, a death-like trance. So Norman said, put her in the deep freeze. Maybe she'll come to again in the cold. So we put her in the deep freeze. And in half an hour, when we looked in at her, she was wiggling happily. At ten degrees below zero, Fred. Now, can you tie that? My goodness, she should have been frozen solid. Well... Nothing special happened for a couple of days. Not you remember, it was a month and a half ago, December 13th, 1948. Where were you on the night of December 18th? A Saturday night, a week before Christmas. I'd been Christmas shopping in the afternoon, I remember. I came back to the laboratory to check up on some stuff. And Norman was there, fiddling with things. Hi, Norm, I said. How's Isabella? You know something funny, Paul? What's the matter with you? Who, me? You look so pale. You sick? Eat something? Disagreed with you? Paul, Isabella's singing. Singing what? Uh, Isabella's singing? <laughs> You're dotty. She's singing. The caterpillar's singing. Not tap dancing, I hope. I'm not kidding you. Oh, cut it out. Open the deep freeze and listen. You've been at the C2H5OH? I haven't had a drink since Thursday night. Well, now, what? Open you... the deep freeze and listen. No kidding? No kidding. Well, we, we don't know where she came from. I won't be surprised at anything. Hello, Isabella. Hey, don't do that. What's the matter? Afraid she'll answer me back? Well, I don't know what. <laughs> Hello, Isabella. <laughs> hey, I hear you singing. I told you. Shh. I don't hear anything. Now, listen, Paul. I haven't lost my button. I've been hearing it all afternoon. I couldn't figure out what was doing it, and then I noticed it was louder alongside the deep freeze here. So I opened it up and stuck my head inside, and it was coming from her. Yeah. Uh, what does it sound like, Norm? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like... Uh, A-E-I... A-E-I? Didn't she say A-E-I-O-U and sometimes W and Y? Now don't rid me. I tell you, I heard it. <laughs> I think you better take a Christmas vacation, Norm. I'm not, no. I know, kid, I know, but listen. We've been playing around with some pretty deep cosmic secrets, you and me. We've managed temporal displacement, which nobody in the world has ever done, see? Uh, maybe we both need a rest. You know what I think, Paul? What? I think we've managed teleportation, too. And we don't know it. Teleportation? You mean like Charles Ford talks about? I mean transporting tangible objects from one place to another without any mechanical means. Electronically? I don't know, Paul. All I know is that that cigarette lighter was someplace where it was awful cold. And it wasn't cold here in this room. Well... And where did that caterpillar come from? I don't know. It came from wherever that cigarette lighter went, Paul. But where? I don't know. Somewhere. And you know what? I'm going to find out where it came from. You are? And how, may I ask you? I'm going to modify this gadget of ours, this hypercucambulator, so that it'll carry a man. And then, my dear boss, I'm going to sit down in it and have you send me out there somewhere in time and space 
and come back and tell you all about it. That's all for tonight, bud. What? Come on, I'll take you out and buy you a drink. I'm not fooling, Paul. Okay, okay, you're not fooling, Norm. Get your hat and coat and come on. <laughs> I prescribe hot buttered rum. Well... Turn off the lights. Will you listen to me for Turn a minute? Turn off the lights. I want hot buttered rum. Okay, okay. Gosh, look out of that window. The northern lights. Oh, they're really bright tonight. They sure are. Look how they pump. Up, down. Up, down. Norm. Up, up. Look at the deep freeze there in the dark. What about? You see it? Light, Paul. Light. It's a... It... I see it, Norm. It's right in step with the northern lights. And the same color. Red, red. Blue, blue. Up, down. Up, Coming down. from the deep freeze where our little friend down. Isabella was singing to you. Now, what hey, do you... Paul, listen. I don't... Listen. for a long time, listening to the voice of the thing in the box, endlessly repeating A-E-I-O-U, the vowel sounds of our speech, and watching the light that pulsed up from the deep freeze in perfect rhythm with the flickering of the northern lights we watched through the window. And we thought long, long thoughts that I, I don't remember any too clearly now. I do know we both of us thought of ways to perfect our little mechanism, our time machine. Our machine that brought back a little cold brown and black caterpillar from somewhere. And when it was morning, and the lights had faded from the northern skies, we found that our machine was very different. The stage where we found the caterpillar was larger now. I had only a vague recollection of what had happened in the night. I said to Norm, Norman, I said, what did we do last night? I don't know for sure, Paul. Did we rebuild that thing? Make it larger? I don't know. I... It too... Well, I mean, I think I dreamed I was working on it. I think I hit my finger with a hammer. Yeah, I see. Hmm. Thumb's all bruised. Certainly looks it. Well, nobody could have gotten in here. The door's locked. And the machine's certainly different. This coil, I think. Look. It's rewound it. Did I do that? My head hurts. Yeah, mine too. Oh, I don't get it. I don't either. I wish I could. Listen, Norm. What? Maybe we did change it. But I... Well, how could we have done all that by ourselves? I got an idea. What? Why, maybe... Isabella helped us. The caterpillar? Oh, let's you're... see, shall we? Open the deep freeze. Well, I opened it. It was empty. There wasn't any brown and black caterpillar in the deep freeze. We took a flashlight and looked over every inch of it. We stood there and looked at each other. For a whole minute. Norman said, well. I just shook my head. And we went over and sat down. All of a sudden I said, I found her, Norman. And here she was, there was little Isabella, the caterpillar, crumpled up stone dead on the floor of the laboratory. Now, you know, caterpillars have little tiny paws. And one of Isabella's paws was the end of a long piece of wire that ran up to the generator coil. Well, how did she get out? And I said the thing couldn't be opened from the inside. I said it was fastened down tight when I took the lid off just now. But she did get out. Maybe. Maybe she did help us, Norm, I said. And he just sat there and stared at me. And I got up and put on my overcoat. Where are you going? Where are you going, Paul? I said, I'm going to find out something, on him. Where I'm going, it's cold, I said. I know that, and I'm going to find out what's been going on and where that caterpillar came from. No one goggled at me. I stepped on the stage of the machine that was to take me away somewhere in time and space. I said, Norm. 
turn it off. Finally, he reached over and touched the switch. He didn't say a word. And I braced myself. I nodded at him. Go ahead, I said. And he pressed the switch. And nothing happened at all. Nothing. Why? I know, Paul, I know. It's daylight, and there aren't any northern lights. Well, it was just as well. I had a chance to think about it a little, and I realized that just an overcoat wouldn't do me any good where I might be going. And so when it was dark night again, and the northern lights were flickering and dancing in the sky, I put on a high-altitude aviator suit that had its own source of heat supply. Norman shook his head as I got back on the stage. Nodded for him to press the switch. Cold. You've never been cold, friend. Dark. You wouldn't know how dark it can get. And then I was standing on an immense plain that stretched so far, so far into the distance, a plain of snow and eternal ice. A dead, cold, white world with the blackest sky above me. And the northern lights reached from horizon to horizon. Even through the high-altitude suit, I could feel a biting cold. And I was afraid, shivering, abjectly afraid. The streamers of the northern lights reached down toward me and wrapped about me. I heard the sound of voices screaming into my mind. I, I could understand them. I wished hardly I'd never played around with cosmic forces. I yelled inside the heavy helmet. I yelled, Norman! Norman, bring me back! And there was nobody to hear me. No, I don't know where I was. Another planet. Maybe the North Pole. Maybe the lights were all around me. Maybe that's where it was, but... You know, it was the most terrible, awful, cold, lonely place you could imagine in a hundred years. The lights, the flickering, living lights crawled over me and beat at me. I could almost understand what they were saying. And then, the crash. The sudden blackness. I was standing again in the laboratory. I'd left only a few short seconds ago, and Norman was tearing at the fastenings of my suit and beating at me with both hands. I wondered what in the world he was doing until I got the helmet off. He was brushing caterpillars off me. Thousands of coal... Freezing cold, brown and black, Isabella Caterpillar. I was in bed for a week or more. I don't know how long. Wherever it was I'd been, I'd nearly frozen to death in those short seconds. And at last, I was able to come back to the laboratory. I sat there that night with Norman. And outside the windows, the northern lights were brighter than they'd ever been before. Purple, green, yellow, black lights even. And there was a new rhythm tonight. A kind of code. Almost words. Thoughts. Not quite formed and yet curiously disturbing. Norman, though, didn't seem to be as disturbed as I was. He, he just sat quietly and looked at me. Where did those caterpillars come from, Paul? I don't know. Where I was, that's all I know. Did you... Did they attack you, or...? I don't know. They came from the lights. The lights? The northern lights. Where are they, Norman? The caterpillars? Yes. Where are they? In the deep freeze, where Isabella was. Poor Isabella. What's the matter with you, Paul? I'm listening. Listening to what? Well, don't you hear them? I don't hear anything. Don't you? I don't hear anything. Well, listen. Listen. I don't hear anything. Turn on the recording machine. I want to see if we could pick up their voices. There isn't anything. Turn it Paul. on. Turn it on. I want a recording. Quick. Quick, Norman. They're talking to us. Listen, friend. I want to play you another recording. 
This is what came out of our tape recorder that night when I was listening to the voices. And Norman couldn't hear anything. Just listen. I still don't hear anything, Paul. Be still, listen. I tell you, I... Listen. What's that? Look at the deep trees. The top's coming open. Look at the light around it, Paul. Be quiet. Watch. How did they... Good Lord, look. The caterpillars are coming out, Paul. Look at them. There's millions of them. Be still, Norman. But, but, but Paul, you, your voice. Be still, I said. What's the matter with your voice? We want to talk to you. You what? You, you said we. Why, of course, Norman. We. Who for the... It is Paul's voice, Norman. Paul's voice. Voice. But it is not Paul speaking. Listen. We speak to you. Paul! Not Paul. We, the people of the lights. We from the cold. We are speaking to you with Paul's voice. I tell you that... Paul's voice will tell you what to do when the time comes, Norman. We go to the machine now. Paul's mind is ours for a little time now. We go to the machine. The machine that brought us to your world from the world of the lights. Who are you? Who? The people of the lights. To take over this world of yours. Only this world of yours is so hot. We must have the cold world. And we know how to make it cold. What's the matter, Paul? Paul! So, so hot. No, no. Quick, Norman. Turn on the machine. Send us to places in your world. No, our world. Hurry. So hot. Hurry. So hot. Paul. Hurry. Hurry. Turn on the machine. <laughs> That's the end of the recording. No, I don't know. I don't have any recollection of it at all. But the recording's there, isn't it? That must be what happened. Anyway, when I woke up, Norman was gone, and there were no caterpillars in the place here. And our machine, our machine that took people and things away into time and space, was wrecked. I don't know what became of it. You heard what they said about my voice. They're going to take over this world and make it a cold world, like the one they came from. Wherever that is. And wherever they went. No, I don't know where they went, where the machine sent them. I do have ideas. Yes. Are you cold? It's freezing in here. And just for example, uh, you read the papers, look at the newsreels. Did you see the pictures of the snow in Los Angeles? In subtropical Los Angeles, where it hasn't snowed for so many, many years. I wondered about it, too. I wonder if anybody saw any brown and black woolly bear caterpillars in Los Angeles. Love of the tiger moth I see, Isabella. Northern Light. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And my laboratory assistant, Norman, was played by Dan Sutter. The voices of Isabella and her friends was that of Cecil Roy. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Now for a word about next week, our writer-director, my good friend, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet, Please. For next week, I have a story for you that comes from the steel mills out South Chicago way. It's called Tap the Heat, Bogdan. <laughs> and so, until next week at this same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. And now, a listening reminder. How are your predictions of things to come? What's your batting average? Compare your average with a man who has made predicting his business.
Listen to Drew Pearson tonight on ABC. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. WJZ, New York's first station, AM and FM. Stand by now for inside news and startling predictions by Drew Pearson, one of the most famous reporters in America. See the amazing new Ben Russ and durable watch, stronger, really shock-resisting. Well, 
I sat dry and comfortable under the fat shelter and laughed at their dripping, mud-spattered labors. It was a good life we led. We the pioneers, we the happy family in the olden good days and the summers and the long, slow winters. In the cheerful spring and the golden harvest days of the fall. Pioneers in the smiling land, unpeopled by enemies, unmarred by discontent and hatred. So it was in the early days of my youth. So it could have been today, were it not for my folly. I remember an evening when my brother and I sat alone in the twilight, resting, he from the toil of the day, and I from the day's pleasure. Brother, I said, brother, tell me something. What did you and father do with the fruit and grain and things you carried away this morning? We took them down to the grove, same as we always do. Well, what did you do with them there? We left them there. Just left them there? Yep, just left them there. Well, why did you do that? Well, you know how father feels. You know how religious he is. I know. But I don't understand why he does this. It seems like... like wasting things. Those things aren't wasted. Well, what happens to them? They're a sacrifice. I don't understand that. Well, it's like this. I... Well, go ahead. Hard to explain. Your father gives you things. Food. Things to play with. What do you do? I don't do anything. You say thank you, don't you? Oh, yes. Well, this sacrifice is a kind of way of saying thank you for all the wonderful things we have. For the field and the sunshine. And the... Well, for everything. We're just living. Oh. We have plenty, you see. It's only fair for us to give up some of it for a thank offering. You understand? What would happen if you didn't do it? I don't know. Would something terrible happen? Would we have bad luck, maybe? Would we die? I don't know. Well, do we just sacrifice what we want to? We sacrifice the best we have, Sonny. Has it got to be the best? That's what your father and I think. And your mother. What if it isn't good enough? It has to be the best things you have. Can I sacrifice something? When you're old enough. I'll sacrifice some wonderful things. Of course you. And they won't be just old ears of corn and bundles of millet and stuff like that. Well, you mean? What's the difference? It's all in the family. 
Yes, but what we'd have done without you, I don't know. Why, we've got that lower field now that was all trees last year. That brings us a good crop. I wish there was something special I could do for you, son. It's all right, Father. I like to work in the field. And those fruit trees, I never saw them bear so much. It was hard work, but we'll have a pleasant winter. Thanks to you. We've got so much. I wish there was somebody we could give some of our plenty to. Don't you, Father? We can give it to the Lord, son. It'll be a mighty sacrifice this year. All the better we have it to give. But I wish sometimes there were some other people we could see, be neighbors with. The day will come, son. The day will come. We may not live to see this world teeming with people, but we're the pioneers, and they live to be grateful to us. I'm thankful I have a son like you. You've got two sons, Father. Oh, yes, but your brother... But what was I to do? What tasks were there left that I could perform to please my father and Mr. Plant, my brother? I could not think. And the other thought, how would I ever prosper in life if I had nothing to give, nothing to sacrifice as my father and my brother did? My mother found me in the dark as I sat there sniveling at my unlucky situation. As I sat there dissolved in unworthy tears of self-pity. Is that you, son? Mother. I've been looking all over for you. What's the matter, dear? I don't feel good. Are you sick, child? I just... I'm just good for nothing. Oh, now, son. What happened? Well... I can't do anything. You can't do anything? What do you mean? Well, brother does everything, and father tells him how wonderful he is, and I'm... I'm just useless. Oh, come now, son. There's plenty for you to do. You always help mother around the house, and you... Well, you... Well, you're young. I'm not either. I'm, I'm just no good. That's a silly attitude for you to take. Now, what put all this in your mind so suddenly? Mother... I want to be useful. Well, you are useful. I haven't got anything to sacrifice. Oh, that's it, eh? Yes. Father... I know, dear. I... I didn't know you were so serious about things. Mother, how can I ever get things if I don't have anything to sacrifice? Get things? Well, I mean... I won't prosper. Oh, you poor child. You come in now and have your supper and you'll feel better. And then in the morning. But in the morning I wandered away, still downcast before my parents and my brother had arisen. I do not remember what dark thoughts occupied my mind as I climbed the dew-drenched hillsides wrestling with my problems. I do not know how far I walked through the morning in the hot sun of noon know where I wandered. I tired with the afternoon, I remember, and under a tall oak tree on the top of a hill, I lay my head and slept. Dreams haunted me. Dreams of my tall, laughing brother, rich and happy, surrounded by a cheerful and happy family in some far land. Dreams of myself, begging bread from a stranger, unblessed and unhappy. Dreams of poverty and want in a world I never knew. I saw myself dependent at long last upon the bounty of my brother, the farmer, the tiller of the soil, a laborer who had enough to sacrifice to ensure a good life for himself, while I suffered the pangs of hunger. And I awoke to the curious stare of a pair of tiny, grave little lambs, two little lambkins who stood and made bleeding noises at the strange figure on the back. Who tottered to me and seized my fingers in their black little mouths and tugged at them valiantly. And so, when at sunset I made my weary way into the clearing around our house, I had found my vocation. The lambs objected mightily to being dragged up for inspection by my father and brother and my weeping mother. But there was a hot supper for me and barley meal for the lambs. And I talked bravely of the prosperity my new acquisition would bring to us all. 
I suppose I was meant to be a shepherd. My two little lambs grew. Presently, there were more lambs. My father taught me to shear them as they grew bigger. I found out the roar of the sheep herder for myself. It was pleasant on the hillsides with the tinkle of the weather's bell. And the flock grew apace. Ah, how I remember those long afternoons. With the clouds drifting lazily above me, the pleasant, drowsy sound of the sheep as they grazed peacefully around me. It was a lazy life, but a good one. I could laze away the afternoon securely, laughing to think of my burly brother toiling away in the sun-baked fields, fighting his eternal battle with the earth for his sustenance. I built my own hut on the hillside above the home place. I lived a pleasant, solitary life. Sometimes my mother and my father would toil up the hill to visit me, bring me cakes of millet or deep jars of sweet wine from my brother's grapes. There was an afternoon. Well, son, you're doing fine with the sheep. I'm glad, father. This is what I like to do. How many have you now? Sixteen. But there'll be lambs in the spring. I'm making you a nice wool coat, son, from the first shearing. Oh, thank you, mother. I wish you could come home oftener, though. You miss me? Of course we do, son. That's why we come up to see you here. But what about... Well, you've got a son around the house all the time. He's pretty busy. How's he doing with the crops? Well, not very well this year. Oh, what's the matter? It's just a bad year, son. What's the matter? Didn't he sacrifice? I don't think I like the way you said that, son. Why... I didn't mean anything, Father. I hope you didn't. Yes, your brother sacrificed. You know he did. Maybe he didn't sacrifice enough. Yes, he did. Or maybe it wasn't good enough. Son, it's not your place to decide what's good and what's bad. I wasn't, Father. I I was only asking. The crops are going to be very small this year. It looks as if you're the support of the family this time, son. Me? (laughs) That's fine. I'm some use... After all, then. Son. Why, of course, your son used sure, a great deal of use. More than my brother. This year, anyway. <laughs> son. I can't help it, Mother. I, I'm happy. Seriously, and my heart bled for them, but it was what I had wanted to do. I chanted the old words of the ceremony loudly and joyfully. The black smoke rose to heaven. We all rejoiced greatly. We all rejoiced. Except my brother. Now it was his turn to stand empty-handed and glum. Although he did try to smile at me when I turned triumphantly away to look at him. The poor, withered ears of corn he put on his own altar looked very meager compared with the lavishness of my gift. And when, in an excess of good feeling, I gave him one of the lambs to offer up on his own altar, he couldn't even make the fire stay lit. I had to help. I was very happy. And I rue the day now. Yes, of course it was selfishness. It wasn't devotion. I was very happy. And when in the morning I left again to return to the hillside pastures, for my flock had grown and there would be much for me to do, my brother calmly came to me and laid a hand on my shoulder. Is it all right if I walk back with you to see the flock? Why, haven't you got anything to do here? There's not a thing to do here. Crops are in, but there is them. Well, isn't that too bad? Yeah, is that? Well, come on along. Thank you. I don't know what happened this year. It is strange, isn't it? You've done well. I'm proud of you. Oh, well, you know, I told you I'd sacrificed something wonderful. Yes, I remember. I sacrificed the first lamb this family ever sacrificed. It was wonderful. Too bad your sacrifice was so cheap and bad. I did the best I could. That's all anybody could do. Oh, well, but you should have been like me. It's all very well to dig up the ground, but it takes something more to do what I've done. I've done pretty well in the past, boy. I don't see how you can expect to do very much when all you've got to offer is some old car and stuff like that. It was good enough for you for a long time. Of course, but now I... I've worked hard all my life. You don't have to work hard if you don't want to. I don't work hard. And look at me. Yes. I think father and mother are a little disappointed in you, you know. They are not. Oh, I think they are. I can see the way they looked at you. And 
At me? I don't believe you. And you didn't do very well with your sacrifice. I, uh, not even when I had to give you something to sacrifice. You stop that. I think your day's over, brother. I think you're going to stop talking that way. If you're done, you were all right till I got started and made a good sacrifice. Paul, go on back and dig holes in the ground, you farmer. You... I'll... You do what? You don't stop talking that way. Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Gem of Purest Ray. Eleftherios Moraitis, M-O-R-A-I. I know how to spell it. I'm Greek, too. Are you? I didn't get your name. Pappas. Nick Pappas, Detective Sergeant, first grade. We got your address, 47 North 51st Street. Well, oh, thank you, sir, Dr. Moraitis. I'm sorry I don't speak modern Greek. I assume that to mean, how do you do, though? That's right. Well, Kala. Well, you Kala, huh? You have to kill in this guy. I have no regrets at all, Mr. Pappas, is it? That's right. Well, go ahead. There's nothing more to say. You know that what you're saying will be used in evidence against you, don't you? Yes, of course. Mm hmm. I'm getting pretty tired of it, Papas. Of what, Dr. Moraitis? Killing these people. Oh? Do you suppose they'll electrocute you? They sure will, Moraitis. Electrocute. What a word. What an experience, too. They tell me. I wasn't thinking about the experience. It's the barbarism of the word that sets my teeth on edge. Words like electrocute, locate, reside. What's the matter with them? They get me down. Well, not to change the subject, but uh, what about these other people you mentioned? Oh. I was just thinking, as long as they're going to send me to the electric chair. Oh, you're on the way, okay, Moraitis. Well, in that case, I might as well tell you about the others. Sure. Go right ahead. And I could warn you at the same time. Warn me? Yes. Warn me of what? Now, these people that have to be killed. Oh? Uh, who are they, Moraitis? 
I'm a perfectly sound mind, Sergeant Pappas. You bet. Well, let's get this confession over with first, huh? Then we'll get on to the warning, huh? Okay. Well, so far as I can remember, there are 32 of them. All together? That I've murdered. Killed. This one makes 33. No, he's the 32nd. Well, nice going. Uh, you have their names, I suppose. No, not all of them. As a matter of fact, I have the names of only a few of them. I could give you the details of the murders, you see, and, and perhaps you could work back from that. Yeah, I suppose we could, couldn't we? But there are so many more of them. So? You, you find them everywhere. Good. And they've all got to be destroyed. Who's going to destroy them? Well, I've destroyed 32 of them. And now you're going to hang me. Objection, Doctor. We're going to fry you. We're trying to save the world. Uh-uh. We're knocking off Mr. Uh, Oliver Meredith, 38, of 202 South Winter Street, to which you have confessed. And for which you will be fried like a fish. I am not a fish. Not yet. He's a fish. Who's a fish? This, this Meredith that I killed. Say, you may get out yet in a loony plea. Sergeant Poplin, did you see Meredith's body? Sure. Did you look at it carefully? Careful enough to see he was dead. Dead as a fish. Did you notice his neck? No. What? There are two scars on his neck. On each side. Just below his ears. That's the coroner's business, Doctor. It's your business. It's everybody's business. Why? Because that's the way you can identify them. Identify who, for gosh sake? The people that are trying to destroy the world. Who? The people from the bottom of the ocean. Those scars on their necks are gills. Gills like a fish. Excuse me. I am becoming ungrammatical. I mean, they are gills such as fishes possess. No fins? I beg you, Sergeant, please don't joke about this. And they come from the bottom of the ocean. They do. Uh, lean over here. Turn your head. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way now. Hmm. How come you got scars on the sides of your neck, Dr. Moraitis? You been to the bottom of the ocean, too? Yes. Those are my gills. Yes. I've been to the bottom of the ocean, too. We Greeks have an enormous affinity for the depths of the sea. Our first heroes were men of the sea, Jason, and Odysseus and the others. We were a sea-going, a sea-loving nation. And the very words we use to describe the sea today came from the Greek, Pelagian of the sea from the Greek pelagos. Plankton, the microscopic animal forms that lie at various levels in the ocean depths, that's a Greek word, too. Plankton, a wanderer. And Atlantis was one of our colonies. Atlantis, whose people so loved the sea that the gods of ancient Greece sunk the whole continent into its depths. You believe that kind of junk? And you'd better believe it, too. Sergeant, Compass of the police? Yeah. Because Atlantis exists today. And its people live. And the ambassadors of Atlantis come from the sea to live beside us. And sow seeds of discontent and hatred among us. Wherever we live. You remember me now, don't you? The Moraidas deep sea exploration group. Men have gone down to the depths of the sea before. William Beebe and his bathysphere, you remember, of course. Bathysphere, we Greeks again. It comes from Bathos. Depths. Uh-huh. But I wanted to go deeper, to plumb the utmost depths of the sea. To get down to the valleys that extend farther below the sea's level and the highest peaks on Earth that stand above it. I... I wanted to find Atlantis. I found myself in possession of certain documents, charts, maps, the existence of which had heretofore never been suspected. And I found the exact 
coordinates of latitude and longitude of the ancient city, the capital of the country that sank below the waves so many, many centuries ago. Uh, no, ne never mind them. They will do you no good to know them. Let it suffice that the depth is something more than eight miles. <clears throat> I beg pardon? I said, go on. No need to tell you either of the details of the construction of my diving bell. It was made to my own specifications, internally braced to withstand the pressure of several tons to the square inch. There was light and heat and large ports set in the sides with cone-shaped plexiglass bed lights, so that no matter what the pressure of the water from the outside, the plexiglass would be only forced in tighter. But the thing busted anyway, didn't it? That was the story. What really happened was somewhat different. Get on with your story, Doctor. If you'd just not interrupt me. Go ahead. If you read the newspaper accounts at the time... When was it? May 17th, 1946. Go ahead. I was going to say that you might have remembered that there was no physical connection between the bell and the surface. That is, it was not on a cable of any kind. It was free. How'd you expect to get back? By releasing ballast, of course, upon which the bell and the people in it, if any, would rise to the surface. We had, of course, radio contact with our headquarters ship on the surface. And you and the woman... Miss Elizabeth Case. You My and... assistant. Yes. You and this Miss Case went down in this thing, and it busted or something, and they pulled you out of the ocean at um, Old Saybrook, Connecticut. They never found Miss Case's body. Is that right? They didn't find Miss Case's body because she is still alive. Or was when I last saw her. Oh, yeah? And uh, when did you last see her, Doc? Standing in front of the Temple of Poseidon. And where is this Temple of Poseidon, if you please? In Atlantis. Forty-some thousand feet below the surface of the ocean. And what was she doing, Doc? She was talking to the high priest. Talking? 40,000 feet underwater, and she talked. Well, Doc, you're really bucking for a Section 8, aren't you? I am telling you the truth, Sergeant Puppet. Okay, go ahead. As long as you don't get violent. It is very quiet in the lower depths of the ocean. I remember the bathymeter showed a depth of 8,000 meters, that is, roughly 20,000 feet, when we saw the first inhabitant of the ocean, completely different from any previous conception of ocean life. Doctor, look out this port. See something? Look. Well. I wonder if it's alive. It, it seems to be. Looks like a great big sheet. Don't see any eyes or a mouth or anything. It's coming closer. It's alive, all right. This is wonderful, isn't it? Well, Doctor, it is alive. Looks like a blanket. Ah, oh, it's turning over. Now maybe we'll see what... <coughs> what did she scream about? The thing turned over, and we saw the other side. Well? The thing was a huge face. A human face, a woman's face. Paper thin, flesh-colored, and alive. Thirty feet across like a huge mat. And, and the thing looked at us, and it smiled, and then it darted toward us, and then he screamed again as the thing wrapped itself around the diving bell. And I could see the plexiglass port start inward with the increased pressure. And then I looked closer at the port, and across its surface outside there in the water a million tiny hands, women's hands, crawled across the glass, clutching, reaching, trying to come inside. And what did you do then, Doc? I am afraid I fainted. Mm-hmm. What about Miss Kate? She fainted, too. I sort of expected that. Well, why shouldn't she? The face that she looked at out there in the depths of the sea was her own. Better and better, Dr. Moraides. Then what? It was black outside when I came to. Black. And immeasurably cold. The thing was gone. There was nothing but blackness. 
I gave her some brandy. Always brandy in these stories. And I took a little myself. Uh Uh-huh. The bathymeter indicated 9,200 meters. And you saw a red, white, and blue turkey with a straw hat. I saw it far below me. The lights of the city. I saw Atlantis. Well? Go on, Doc. I show you this jewel. Yeah? What is it? I found it on the floor of my diving bell. A moment after, I saw the lights of Atlantis below me. How did it get there? I don't know. Well, what is it? You ever read Thomas Gray's elegy written in the country churchyard? I guess so. High school. The uh, curfew tolls the knell of parting day. Why? Let me quote one of the couplets to you. Full many a gem of purest ray serene the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Go on, Doctor. I suspect that Thomas Gray was trying to tell the world something. That's kind of reaching for it, Doctor. I didn't know where it came from, I told you. That's right. But Betty Case knew. Betty Case gasped when she saw it. Uh, Where did that come from? Well, I don't know. It was on the floor. Give it to me. Well, what are you so anxious? Because it's mine. Oh, well. (laughs) I I had a weird idea. It came from from outside. (laughs) Isn't that silly? No, Dr. Mara, either. It isn't silly. What? It did come from outside. And the two red scars on her neck, just below her ears. The red scars I had never noticed before, pulsed as she spoke. And I was struck with a queer, fleeting thought. Why? She looks just like a fish. Out of water. I could feel the motion of the diving bell quicken, and in a moment it was like an express elevator dropping down out of control from some great height. <laughs> Betty Case was laughing at me, and queer things sped past the port. The light grew stronger in my mind. Suddenly I was flung to the floor of the bell as it thumped against the bed of the ocean. The bottom of the bell registered 13,800 meters below sea level. We had come to rest eight miles below the surface where the sun danced on the waves. And we sat in bright light in the streets of Atlantis. Well, it's a great story, Dr. Moraida. A crowd of people in the street. A crowd of people dressed in the garments of ancient Greece. A sound of music that set the beryllium steel walls of the diving bell to humming. Men and women and children in the light of great lamps beaming down from tall marble columns. Men and women and children living and moving and breathing eight miles below the ocean surface. And I turned to look at that again. I remembered, Doctor, when I saw the door. I remembered when I dreamed after the face looked in on us and I fainted. And when I saw the jewel... This can't be. This is utterly, fantastically impossible. No, it is not, Doctor. Look outside. They're coming closer. Betty, look out. Do you see them? Yes, I see. It isn't impossible, Doctor. This is Atlantis. It is. It's that language. I'm home again. And she started for the door of the diving bell. Started reaching out for the mechanism that would unlock it. That would open and let the sea in to crush its boat. And I leaped in front of it to prevent it. But she raised the jewel and held it in front of my eyes and I felt my strength leave me suddenly. And all I could see 
like the coruscating brightness of a jewel burning into my eyes. And all I could hear was her voice echoing hollowly against the steel wall. No. Never seek to stop me now, man of her. And I thought idly of the archaic form of speech she employed. This girl who was on earth the most prosaic, dry as dust, laboratory assistant. Never seek to stay my hand. Nor turn thy eyes away from the gem of purest ray. For thy faith is before thee now. And thou shalt go forth into the depths where mortal man hath not yet trod. And I thought with considerable surprise. Why? She's speaking the purest of ancient Greek. And I'm understanding it. Now let thee become as one of us. And I watched her calmly as she extended the gleaming jewel toward me. And I felt it touch the sides of my neck just below the ears, and a searing cold pain went through my body. And suddenly I was gasping for breath. I drew in great gulps of the oily air of the rising bell, and with each breath I grew weaker and weaker. I was suffocating, like a fish out of water. And as the darkness shot with flashes of red descended upon me, and I knew I was dying. I dimly saw her touch the scar on her neck with a jewel, and she was gasping suddenly, too. And I saw her reach again for the lever that operated the door, and it burst open. And I felt life returning to me as I breathed in great lungfuls of cold, pure salt water. gave me my own jewel. A jewel that lies on your deathbed. Fosan, the elder, with his white beard and a look of antiquity in his eyes, he has lived since Atlantis first disappeared beneath the ocean. Fosan spoke to me many times. Never lose the jewel, Eleftherio. When you go back to the land, you will need it to change it back from a water breather to an air breather, you see. I'm going back then? Yes, of course. There are a great many messages that I want to send to our people on the land. Messages that cannot be trusted to our ordinary radio, you see. Because the time is almost here. The time? I forgot that you didn't know. Is Betty going back with me? No, she stays here. She'll be here when you come back. Well, must I come back? <laughs> you don't want to die, do you? What do you mean? There isn't going to be any place for you to live up there, you know. What? Sit down, son. You're happy, aren't you? I'm uh, pretty confused, sir. <laughs> no doubt. May I ask you some questions? You can ask them, yes. Well, how is it done? Are you living here? <laughs> Time enough for that. We live. Isn't that enough? No. Next question. Well, Betty, she's from the land, isn't she? Originally, yes. Did you ever hear of the bark Marie Celeste? I seem to. It was lost with all hands. That is, all hands were lost. They found the ship. Sailing along with all its sails set. Food on the table, still hot. And nobody aboard. It was one of the greatest mysteries of the sea. I remember. That it was a passenger on the Mary Celeste. But, but that was more than a hundred years ago. Yes, that's so. Oh. And the Carrier Cyclops that was lost in your World War in 1918. Remember that? Yes. They're all here. The Cyclops crew. They are? Well, except those we sent up to the surface. Well, what do you send those people up there for? Well, we've decided that we are the ones that the world belongs to, Elephilios. You people up on the surface have made a pretty bad mess of things. And we're going to take it away from you. How? What we want is a world that's covered with water everywhere. Land is useless to us. But... But what? The people up there. 
My people? Hmm. Are you proud of your people, Eleftherio? Well, well, of course. Look, so we're essentially kind-hearted people down here. And we're a great many. There are more of us than there are people on the land. Well, yes, but I... Don't interrupt. You think your people are so clever. Where do you think they get their knowledge? Of oh, what, for instance? Of ways to make war, for instance. Of ways to make deadlier and deadlier war. They didn't think of those things themselves. You know where they got their ideas. You're not going to tell me. Oh, but I am. <laughs> Look, son, there are right now 65,211 Atlanteans on the surface of the Earth. In every country that's known, and some that aren't very well known, they speak every language. They look like Earth people, except for the two little stars on their necks. And they're doing a great job. I don't believe it. Well, you better believe it, son, because one of these fine days, your little friend's upstairs. I'm going to blast all the continents right off the face of the earth. You know what happens then? I... Yes, that's right. There won't be anything but water on this little old planet. So you can make your choice. You can use your jewel like the other Atlanteans up there will, and come on back down here. Or... Blub, blub, son. Blub, blub. Strictly, blub, blub. I don't know if that thing doesn't kill you when it goes off. So, <clears throat> what do you say? What do you want me to do? <laughs> Go on back for a while and help us in our little whispering campaign to destroy the continent. I won't do it. Well, son, down here on the bottom, we've solved the problem of combating pressure. If you decide not to come along with us, we'll uh, just take that control off you. Tap you with the business end of the little jewel here, and you know what'll happen? I have an idea. Oh, no. No, you haven't. You haven't any idea. But, son, it will be awful. Come on, make up your mind. what the old gentleman wants back? I have not. I told you I've killed 32 of them so far, including this Meredith. It's a great alibi. You think I'm going to betray the people of the Earth, man? You're betraying the people of the sea, aren't you? What? You heard me. Well, it's a great story, Doc. I knew that you wouldn't believe me. It's a great story. But you don't believe it. Think I'm crazy? What? Of course I believe it, Doc. What? Sure, I do. Look at that. Come here, Doc. What do you want? I want you to look at the size of my neck, Doc. Just below the ear. You. You. Sure, Doc. See? What are you going well, to I'm do? I'm going to electrocute you, Doc. Nah, Doc. The old gentleman downstairs has got better tricks than that for people to try to cross him up. Come on, Doc. Pick up your crystal. You and I have got a date in Atlantis. And oh, brother. by Willis Cooper and Moraides, the man who spoke to you, was Ernest Chappell. And Morton Lawrence played Pappas. Charita Bauer was Betty Chase. Edgar Staley was Fosan, the Atlantean. As usual, music for choir, please, is played by Albert Berman. Now for a word from our writer director, Willis Cooper. Never having been to the bottom of the sea, I can 
uncertain whether the various Atlanteans really exist outside my own imagination. I can assure you, however, that none of the characters in tonight's story are based on any living person, or any dead one, for that matter. Next week's quiet, please, is called In the House Where I Was Born. next week at this same time, and Mr. Cooper's story, In the House Where I Was Born, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. has come to you from Mutual Studios in New York City. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System.